Okay, hello everyone and welcome back to the Collaborative Science for Estuaries webinar series. This is our last webinar of the summer before we take a short break. I'll say more about that at the end, but uh, welcome back. Today we're talking about soundscape ecology, which is a promising new field uh, that studies the sounds produced above and below water using a variety of acoustic sensors. So last year, this project team partnered with three reserves in Texas, South Carolina, and Florida to collaboratively develop a framework for a new acoustic research and monitoring program that can be integrated with current programs in the reserves. So today, I will have some speakers from that project team who are going to run us through their project. Uh, some quick background before we jump into the full presentation. So for those who are new, um, the National Estuarine Research Reserve System is a national network of unique research reserves as shown on this map. This is a NOAA program that works in collaboration with a local place-based partner, either a state agency, university, or nonprofit. Each reserve site includes programs focused on land stewardship, research and scientific monitoring, training programs for the public and local officials, and education. The Science Collaborative Program supports science for estuary and coastal decision makers by coordinating regular funding opportunities and supporting user-driven collaborative research assessment and transfer activities that address critical coastal management needs identified by the reserves. And the webinar series features project teams supported by the Science Collaborative program staff and partners. Speakers share their unique approaches to addressing current coastal and estuary management issues. And if that sounds interesting to you, please feel free to join us for future webinars. So for housekeeping, just a couple quick notes. All attendees were muted upon entry and will be handling questions via the question feature on the GoToWebinar console. You can enter your questions for the presenters as they occur to you throughout the webinar, which we encourage you to do so you don't forget them. And we'll discuss as many as we can during the final portion of today's webinar. And if any questions are not answered in session, we'll try to pass those on to the presenters to get answered after the fact and include in the final summary document that we'll make available after the webinar as well. Uh, chat is also visible to organizers only, so you can use it to alert us if you have any technical issues and need some help troubleshooting. We've got a couple of folks in the Science Collaborative who are working behind the scenes and it can help answer those questions as well. So with that, I'll go ahead and introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Christopher Biggs is a faculty member at the University of Texas at Austin's Marine Science Institute. His work utilizes hydrophones to monitor sound production in marine organisms to understand behavior, productivity, and habitat utilization, along with the impacts of anthropogenic noise. Chris served as the project leader of the Science Collaborative uh, Catalyst Project. And Philip Sousa is a PhD student at the University of Texas at Austin's Marine, Institute, Science, marine science Institute. His research uses passive acoustic techniques to monitor soundscapes in the Mission Narancis estuary with a focus on biological sound production. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Chris to take over. All right, thank you, Nick. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm excited to uh, share the work we did on this project with acoustic monitoring. And I also need to thank my, my team here, um, Robert Dunn and Matthew Kimball from uh, North Inlet Winyah Bay, Eric Monty from the University of South Carolina, Beaufort and Kevin Boswell at FIU, and as well as the people in Mercury Bay, um, all did a lot of work on this project. So it truly was a collaborative effort in the end. And so this was a catalyst project. Um, and so our main objectives were to create a collaborative network of scientists and managers, but also educators in each of the three reserves we worked in and the three regions to, to develop this um, acoustic monitoring framework. And we really should try to approach it from a, a co-development point of view and um, work together with all of our end users in, in doing this. And so here's the picture of our Mission Aransas estuary down here in South Texas. and as Similar to many estuaries, it's a very um, diverse and complex and varied habitat, and it's also extremely productive. And so it's you know really important that we understand all the aspects of this and how these systems respond to ecosystem change and things like that. And especially with the NERS now, the system-wide monitoring program has done a great job at collecting a lot of this data and understanding the system, especially when it comes to things like water quality in some cases, meteorological data and um, things such as primary productivity. But anything above that trophic level, any other kind of biological activity, we have seen as a, a gap that there needs to be more information. There's the opportunity to really fill out that picture of what's happening in our system. So that was one of the main um, drivers of this project too, was try to, to get a, more of that biological activity component. And so when I'm Thinking of 
studying fish and organisms and understanding their behavior and habitat use. For my money, I generally like to do it someplace warm, tropical, where I can see very clearly in the water so I can go diving, like in Palau, it's nice. And I can just go down there and count fish and watch what they're doing and see which organisms they're using the habitat. But as I imagine most estuaries and ours especially, the water often looks like this on a good day. So if you squint, you can see some fish in there, but that's about it. So obviously this presents the um, opportunity for us to use some other methods in understanding the biological activity and what's going on with these organisms. And so that's really where, where sound comes into play here. And why we're trying to use sound to understand the environment is because we can't see what's going on. Um, and so at this point also I will mention in the realm of marine science, when you use the word acoustics, it can mean a few different things. Um, and so I always like to clarify that. You can have active acoustics, which is where you are actively putting sound in the environment and it bounces or echoes off things and that gives you some information. So those are like echo sounders or sonar. Um, and that's one way to study using sound. There's also acoustic telemetry where you will implant organisms with little radio tags and then track their movements with an array of receivers. Neither of those types of acoustics will be the ones I'm talking about today. Today, I'm only gonna be talking about passive acoustics. And so that is just listening to the sounds that are occurring in the water. So we use these hydrophones, which are just underwater microphones, and they just record the sounds that are happening in the environment. So very broadly, we can categorize those sounds as either biological, geophysical, or anthropogenic as far as their source goes. So biological sounds can be widely varied, anything from little tiny shrimp to cryptic fish that we can't see, to larger fish that we can see, and of course marine mammals are all contributing to these biological sounds in the, in the water, underwater environment. Um, you also have geophysical sounds, so wind and waves pushing water around you can pick up and that creates noise. Um, rain is especially loud underwater. And then you have anthropogenic sound as well. So this can be anything from recreational boats to shipping um, traffic. Um, you can even have bridges over water where that car noise is impinging on the marine environment as well. And of course there's gas and oil activities and, and pile driving. All those things can be anthropogenic sounds that are contributing to the soundscape of that underwater environment. And really we could spend probably hours or a week talking about biological sounds alone and all the different sources. But for today, I'll just give a couple examples of some of the sounds we hear, and then I'll get into more of the framework that we developed um, as part of this acoustic monitoring project. So the first one we'll look at are snapping shrimp. And so pretty much if you stick your head in the water in any tropical or temperate environment, you're gonna hear snapping shrimp. And you're probably gonna hear quite a few of them. It's one of the most ubiquitous sounds that you get. Um, and so before we listen to the sound, I will, orient you to the graph we're looking at. This is called a spectrogram, and really it's just a visual representation of a sound. And so on the x-axis you have time going through the recording, and on the y-axis you have frequencies. And those are all the different frequencies that the sound is composed of. And then the colors on the graph indicate how loud or how intense that sound is at each frequency. And so as we listen to it, you can try to see how that matches up. And, and this is really one of the most um, important ways that we use to analyze sounds. So we both listen to them and look at sounds to identify the source and what's going on and behaviors associated with it. So I think we can go ahead and play the sound of snapping shrimp. And so I didn't mention, um, Go ahead and turn up your volume if you can, or sometimes headphones, it's a little bit easier to hear some of these sounds as well, if you have those, or if you're having trouble hearing them. Um, but you can listen to them. I often like to have my students try to describe the sounds and the different um, things they hear. It helps them think about how you characterize and, and can classify these things. So if you came up with snap, crackle, and pop, you're correct. This is how we call them. <laughs> um, but as far as the sound itself, it covers a wide frequency range. So we call it a broadband sound. You know, you can see on the y-axis anything from you know 
100 hertz up to um, even 40 kilohertz, you can still hear that snapping sound. And it comes in a very random pattern. There's no, no real rhythm to those sounds, just lots of individuals going off in kind of a, a random pattern. And so that's how we identify those as snapping shrimp. The next one we'll listen to is spotted sea trout. Now these are really interesting fish. They are members of the drum family, cyanidae. So they, all the drum fish make sounds and they make these drumming noises. With spotted sea trout, the males make drumming sounds and they make it when they're spawning. So we can use these sounds to identify where and when these fish spawn. So that's really helpful to us trying to understand their behavior and it's really fun to listen to. So if we look at this spectrogram, you can already see the sound looks quite a bit different than, this, than the uh, snapping shrimp. But let's go ahead and give a listen to the spotted sea trout as well. All right, so that sound I generally describe as there's two main components. There's a grunt, the longer kind of dropping in frequency sound, and then you have these staccato pulses that we use to identify them. And then we also look at the specific frequency band. So in this case, our y-axis is on a logarithmic scale, but most of the energy, most of the intensity of the sound for those sea trout is happening between 250 and 500 hertz. So between the rhythm and the frequency band, we can identify these as spotted sea trout. And these are also really interesting because they get together in aggregations to spawn. And at that point, when you get a large group of them all calling at once, you can't hear individuals anymore. So it turns into this kind of din that we call a chorus. There's kind of sounds like But if we've seen this lead up to that and we've seen those frequencies in there, we can still identify that as an aggregation of sea trout. So now we'll move into more of the framework and, and how we plan on integrating this acoustic monitoring into the, the NERS in these regions. And so it started off as a collaboration with three NERS, Mission Aransas, Rookery Bay, and North Inlet Winya Bay. And so we wanted to design this in a way that really addressed the primary research and management needs in each of these regions. And so we started off with a several day workshop where we included um, all three sectors in the NERS. So people from the research, stewardship, and education sectors within this workshop to identify the um, research needs and management priorities in each region, and then give an overview of acoustic research and see how those things align and how um, there's po possible overlap between the regions that uh, acoustic monitoring could address. And so part of one of the activities we did was use these maps of each region and then individuals could go in and annotate those maps and identify targeted areas of interest, or they could identify where ongoing or upcoming projects were gonna be that might be of interest or um, work well with this kind of uh, monitoring approach. And so you can see from the map, oyster reefs were already popping up as a area of interest among the three NERS. We also included other end users, not just people with the NER, but we talked with um, state fisheries agencies, resource managers, and conservation groups as well. And so after we had kind of initial straw man uh, framework developed, we went to these agencies and had meetings with them and talked with them about their needs and their priorities um, and to see how acoustic monitoring might slot in there as well. And then towards the end of the project, once we had that kind of combined, we got everyone together. So all the end users and all the collaborators together um, went through another series of workshops that included um, breakout groups and discussions of each aspect. And then ultimately had each organization rank their top priorities of, of what they would like to see acoustic monitoring address in their region. And that way we could select our final um, priorities that we would incorporate into the framework. And so across the board, oyster habitat was identified as one of the common themes. So people looking at assessing habitat health and um, biodiversity and ecosystem function was universal and looking at biodiversity in those areas. And so we chose um, to look at oyster reefs 
And this is comparing established or healthy reefs to ones that have been recently harvested or recently, recently restored to compare those. In addition, people were interested in the impacts of anthropogenic noise across the board. And so this could be both due to recreational boat traffic and things like that, but also from commercial shipping or even the noise associated with harvesting having a secondary effect on other organisms, not the target one that they're harvesting as well. And then also looking at using acoustic monitoring to monitor visitor use of habitats as well. And so those are the three priorities that we focused on. And so next I'll go through and um, I wanted to highlight again that within our framework, we were designing this in a way that would integrate with each sector of the NERF. So we have components that address the research priorities, the stewardship components, and also the education sector of each NERF. And I'll go through and give examples of how we um, can address each of these areas next. But we have also created an infographic um, booklet that outlines this whole approach as well. And I think we can drop the link to that into the, into the chat or um, send that out as well. Um, it's also available through our project page, which I believe the links will be shared with you. So just to start going through some of these examples, as I mentioned before, the system-wide monitoring program within all the NERS has been really great. And it's um, these kinds of you know, stations that collect water quality and meteorological data, as I said. But again, this data is available. There's a wide range of it and it covers up to usually primary production, but biological activity on top of that is, is generally missing and not captured. And so that's where we believe that this acoustic monitoring can come into play is to fill in that gap. As we saw, there's a whole host, host of organisms that are making sounds that we can gain information from. So one example of this could be looking at spotted sea trout again. And so as I said, they produce sound during spawning. So by monitoring that sound production, we can tell where a fish spawns, when they spawn, and for how long that spawning happens. And that helps us understand the productivity of that population. So with this graph, we have days in April in 2018 along the x-axis, and we have sound pressure level on the y-axis, and that's measured in decibels. But it really is just a proxy for spawning activity. And so anytime that sound pressure level, in this case, goes above 120 decibels, that's a spawning event. And so that's what we can do, and we can look at this and look at the frequency and the patterns of spawning. But what it also does is helps us identify when there's um, disturbances or when spawning ceases for some reason. So for these days in April, those peaks do not reach that 120 decibel threshold. And if we go in and listen to those files, spawning did not occur then. And when we started comparing it to environmental variables, we saw that the water temperature actually dropped below 20 degrees during that time. And so that's that threshold for spawning for these sea trout in our region is 20 degrees. If the water drops below then, you're probably not going to get spawning from that population. Another aspect that we're interested in is using this acoustic monitoring to look at ecosystem health and biodiversity and ecosystem function. And in this case, especially, like I said, between established and healthy reefs and degraded reefs. Now, Bill will talk more about this and give some great examples of the specifics of how you can actually use acoustic monitoring in these instances, but generally, we expect to see louder sounds and more diverse sounds at a healthy reef versus one that's degraded. And so then we can use that acoustic monitoring to look at the habitat use and ecosystem health and look at specifically restoration effectiveness and the impacts of harvesting. And we can do this by measuring the rates of recovery. So things like recolonization rates or the return of ecosystem function. Um, and again, Phil will go into that in more detail of how that actually looks. So in terms of stewardship and approaching that sector of the NERS, um, we were interested in looking at anthropogenic noise and those impacts. So one of the primary roles of sound production and organisms is for communication. So you can imagine as the amount of um, noise in the environment due to boats and shipping 
increases, there's more of a chance for that to affect that communication. And so on the left, we have the spectrogram, and this is of a boat traveling right over the hydrophone. So we can take a listen to that and see just how loud that sounds. You can see it's a fairly broadband sound, covers a large range of frequencies. So pretty much no matter what frequency those organisms are producing sound at, that boat noise is gonna be competing with it or masking and covering up that sound so it can infringe that um, communication. And most of the work that's been done on the impacts of noise to this point have been focused on marine mammals. And so there's much less understood about how this infects fish or, or other organisms. The other side of stewardship that came up across all of our end users was monitoring visitor use. And so this can be done to monitor um, you know, recreational fishing, tourism of any kind, or even commercial harvesting of oysters or, or shrimp or something like that. Um, all this falls under visitor use. And it's an com important component when we're looking at measuring um, ecosystem value or even monitoring the compliance with regulations and when areas are closed or um, the number or times of visitors is regulated. So those are, these are two of the applications that we can imagine using for, for stewardship as well. And in fact, a recent um, study by Matt Kendall um, and others working out at Gray's Reef looked at different ways of monitoring visitor use. And what they found was that acoustic monitoring, these passive acoustics was actually um, the best, it gave, us, gave them the most power. That is, in this case, it was the power of identifying a 25% increase in visitation over time. And so there's good support for using this. And we think this path of acoustic approach can be utilized in the coastal estuarine systems as well. For the education aspect, we tried to take the different approaches we use and the information we have of acoustics and really use that to enhance ongoing education programs within the NERS. So in this case, we used the Teachers on the Estuary program as our model and slotted it into that. But really these activities can be used in any kind of educational or outreach program. Um, and there was three components. The first one was more of a classroom-based exploring sound where students develop intuitions about how sound works underwater and they get to play some fun games and understand how a hydrophone works. So really you have this mobile hydrophone and a tub of water, and then that's linked to uh, an acoustic recorder or an amplifier with headphones. And so one student comes up with a phrase, speaks it into the tube underwater, the other student listens, and then they play a game of telephone, where then the next student comes up and they trade places. And then you go through the whole class and see how the phrase is matched up at the end. And you can use things like bubblers um, that create air bubbles to um, imitate the sound of boats, which actually works quite well, and see how that affects the ability to communicate using sound. And so they get some intuition that way. And then the other two act activities, one is listening to actual recordings from the field, and students try to identify the source and how many individuals are creating those sounds. And then another one where they're actually interpreting data, so looking at spawning sites compared to fishing sites and navigation channels and identifying areas that might be focused for protection or areas where there might be larger impacts um, from anthropogenic activities to spawning sites and things like that. And again, these are all described in more detail in our infographic booklet as well that you can find. So in conclusion, um, the management needs we are really trying to address with this acoustic monitoring framework started with looking at this habitat assessment and looking at habitat quality and ecosystem health, biodiversity and ecosystem function, and especially between these established healthy reefs and ones that have been either recently restored or recently harvested. The other component is looking at these soundscape patterns over time to get a baseline of what's normal for each region. And so this allows us to see how and when they change according to environmental conditions. So it's really getting at this idea of short-term variability and long-term change. And again, we're capturing those higher, higher trophic levels and the biological activity there with that. Then looking at 
daily and seasonal patterns of visitor use and then seeing how the noise created from some of that can also impact organisms in our beach region as well. And then taking those and implementing with them with the education activities within each NER. And so that was our general approach and it's outlined and what we're hopefully moving forward with. Um, and then I'll give it up to Phil next and he'll um, give you some more concrete examples of how, how all that looks. But again, I wanna thank all my collaborators. Um, it was a large effort, um, these three regions and a whole host of end users and we all had a, a very positive experience with it. So it's been very hopeful. All right, there you go, Phil, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Let's see. All right, um, so as Chris mentioned, I'm gonna be talking to you about the passive acoustic monitoring of oyster reefs in Southeast Texas. Um, as Nick mentioned earlier, I'm a PhD student at the University of Texas Marine Science Institute. And a lot of my work focuses on using passive acoustics to uh, study community health and function within the Mission Aransas estuary in Southeast Texas. Over the past 12 months or so, um, a lot of my effort has been focused on monitoring oyster reef communities. These are communities that are built by the Eastern oyster, which provide habitat for a diverse assemblage of marine invertebrates and fish. These communities in turn provide um, several ecosystem services that are really important to adjacent human populations. Um, for example, fisheries enhancement of some of our um, important recreational fisheries like spotted sea trout and black drum. And they also play an important role in the nutrient and energy cycling within the system. There are a lot of uh, species that are vocalizing um, on these reefs for uh, communication and spawning purposes. Um, they can be broken down into residents and transients. Um, so residents would be species that are spending uh, most of their lives on these oyster reefs. Transient species would be species that are only spending part of their life cycle um, on these oyster reefs. Uh, so they might be using them as um, foraging habitats or nurseries, um, but certainly not there uh, all the time. Um, and so I did want to uh, play a couple of examples for you. I know Chris um, played some. So Nick, if you don't mind playing the video on the bottom right, the hardhead catfish. Well, that sound uh, has been compared to the sounds of percolating coffee um, in some of the literature that I've uh, read. So if you can imagine that sound. And then I'll, uh, I know Chris already showed you the um, sounds from the snapping shrimp, but they do sound a lot like a Rice crispy cereal when you have that nice snap, crackle and pop. And um, I'd like to play one more sound uh, if we have it. It's the gulf toadfish on the top left. All right. Um, so I have no clever comparisons for that one, uh, but it is a really cute noise by an adorable um, organism. So there are a lot of species that are producing sound on these reefs, and at times these soundscapes are, are very loud and very diverse. Um, so one question that I'm really interested in answering is, can we use these sounds to monitor oyster reef health? And the idea behind this is that when you have a healthy reef, um, you would expect an abundant and very diverse uh, community to be associated with that. Um, so you'd expect the soundscape to be loud and pretty complex. If you move to the right-hand side of the screen and the reef experiences any type of degradation, um, you'd expect the community to be less abundant and less diverse. Uh, so you might expect the soundscape to be a bit quieter and less complex. Um, and the opposite would be true if the reef experiences any type of recovery. So in order to sort of test these relationships and, and validate this, I'm uh, conducting paired community and acoustic sampling um, at these sites highlighted here. So we have the Lap Reef in Copano Bay, Grass Islands Reef and Goose Island Reef in Aransas Bay, and we recently added a fourth study site in St. Charles Bay at the top of the screen here. 
So for acoustic monitoring, I deploy one acoustic recorder at each reef site. These are set to record a one minute sound file every 10 minutes. So it's a 10% duty cycle. Um, once these sound files are collected, they're analyzed in several different frequency bands to generate um, a few different measures. The first is sound pressure level. And SPL can be thought of as a measure of relative loudness. So when you have higher levels of SPL, it indicates a louder soundscape. We also look for acoustic complexity index. Um, and this measures differences in sound levels across frequency bands and also time. So when you have higher levels of ACI, it indicates a more complex or uneven soundscape. And finally, I manually review a subset of the files for fish calling activity to determine which fish species are calling and at what times. For community sampling, I deploy nine oyster sampling units per reef site. Um, these are these boxes that are shown in the top right-hand side of the screen. It's a plastic milk crate that's lined about a third of the way up with mosquito netting and then topped off of that line with halved oyster shells. So these are attached to the reefs using uh, a couple pieces of rebar left to soak for three to four weeks at a time, um, during which time all of the critters in the immediate area can start to colonize that box. After that soaking period, I go in with this custom trap, um, fit it over the top, pull the whole thing up, and count, measure, and identify everything within the box. And with, th with that data, I'm able to generate measures of abundance, biomass, and species richness, which I can compare to some of the acoustic measures that we're getting on the reefs. So here are some of the critters that we see uh, pretty often in our oyster sampling units. On the top left, we have a, a gulf toadfish. This is the largest resident sound producer on the reefs. On the bottom left is a big class snapping shrimp. Um, again, another sound producing animal. And then on the bottom right, we have a skillet fish. Um, and this is the only one of the three that is non-sound producing. Um, so it is important to know that we're getting a mix of sound producing and non-sound producing organisms in our trays. We also find some rare things from time to time. So on the top middle, we have a speckled worm eel. Um, and we were very fortunate and excited to find a couple of these uh, in our tray on, I think it was the Goose Island site um, last summer. On the bottom right, we have a juvenile mangrove snapper. Um, so this would be another example of a more mobile or transient species that we might collect in our trays from time to time. And then on the top right, um, we also see a lot of evidence or direct evidence of reproduction happening on the reefs. Um, so this is an oyster shell that's lined with what we believe were skillet fish eggs. So I wanted to go through um, a couple of the relationships that we've tested so far, starting with sound pressure levels and biomass. Um, so again, sound pressure level can be thought of as a measure of loudness. Uh, on the um, figure on the left here, on the y-axis, we have sound pressure level in the low frequency band. Um, so it's 50 to 2,500 hertz. And this is the frequency band that usually encompasses most fish vocalizations. On the x-axis, we have biomass. Um, and this is total biomass, so it includes invertebrates and fish. The relationship that we found here was positive and significant. Um, with an r square value of 0.38, we then looked at the relationship between sound pressure level in the low frequency band and just fish biomass. And the relationship that we found was even stronger with an r square value of 0.6. Um, so what these data are suggesting is that these reefs are becoming louder with increased resident biomass. We also looked at the relationship between acoustic complexity index and species richness. Um, so on the left here, we have ACI in the broadband. Um, so this is 50 to 40,000 hertz. Uh, on the x-axis, we have species richness, which includes, again, invertebrates and fish. The relationship was positive and significant with an R-square value of 0.41. We then looked at the relationship between ACI and the low frequency bands and fish species richness. And again, the relationship was even stronger with an R-square value of 0.59. Um, so what these data are suggesting is that the oyster reef soundscapes are becoming more complex with increased resonant bio biodiversity. Uh, all of these results were really exciting to see, and we decided to take the next logical step and use these findings to monitor the communities on these reefs through time. 
under different scenarios. Um, so we wanted to look at these communities following reef restoration, um, natural disturbance that might occur while we have the recorders in the water, and oyster dredging. Um, so first I'll walk through some of the monitoring at the reef restoration sites. For this particular project, we were focusing on the Goose Island site. Um, here there are two sets of restored reefs. The first was restored in 2012 um, by the Heart Research Institute. So I'll be referring to these reefs as the established reefs. And then uh, a few hundred yards away, um, they restored some, uh, some new reefs in June of 2021. Um, so we started monitoring all of these sites uh, within a week of the installment of the new reefs. So we were really able to capture the development of the community and the soundscape right from the beginning. So this was our expectation here in thinking about sound pressure levels at these two sites. Um, we expected the SPL levels to be relatively constant on the established reef. We expected um, the sound levels to uh, be quieter on the newly restored reef at the beginning of the study, to become louder over time as that oyster reef is colonized. Um, and eventually level off either at or near the SPL levels uh, observed at the established reef. Instead, we got a very different signal on the reefs. Um, so indeed, the established reef was quite a bit louder uh, than the newly restored reef at the beginning of the study, but about 10 days in, uh, the SPL levels on this reef uh, really took a nosedive, after which point SPL levels on both reefs started to uh, gradually increase again um, sort of at different rates and what had happened here was during the second week of the study um, it started to rain and it rained for about seven days straight um, and this led to an acute freshwater inflow event at our site and reduced the salinity from 17 to 0 0.2 um, during that seven, seven day period uh, so it was essentially fresh water by the time it finally let up and I went back in and reviewed some of the sound files during that period. And what had happened is that everything that was producing sound, whether it was the invertebrates or the fish, um, stopped producing sound for a little bit. Um, and that's when you get that nosedive or that really steep decline in SPL levels. Um, we also looked at acoustic complexity index during this time um, and the trends were very similar. So the main takeaway from these two graphs is that the soundscape became louder and more complex over time as this reef uh, recovered from the freshwater inflow events and in the case of the newly restored reef um, continued to develop. We also looked at fish calling activity at these sites during this time. Um, so here we have summed calling activity on the y-axis and date on the x-axis. Um, so when you're looking at this figure, just know that higher levels of sound calling activity um, mean that there was more calling activity for the fish on the right-hand side of the screen um, in a given day. So before the freshwater inflow event, sound calling activity was relatively high on both reefs, um, but a little bit higher on the established reef. And there was also a pretty high call diversity. So there were four species that were vocalizing before the freshwater inflow events, the gulf toadfish, the hardhead catfish, the spotted sea trout, and an unidentified um, croaking organism. Immediately following that freshwater inflow event, um, some calling activity dropped off pretty dramatically um, on both reefs and uh, call diversity also dropped. Um, so the soundscapes were really dominated by uh, two species during that time, the hardhead catfish and the unidentified croaking organism. After about two or three weeks of recovery, um, some of the species that were vocalizing before the freshwater inflow event started to vocalize again, um, including the gulf toadfish and the spotted sea trout. Um, so you can really see the recovery of the soundscapes at these two sites um, and looking at fish calling activity as well. Another really useful tool um, for looking at biological activity at these reef sites is generating uh, long-term spectrograms. Um, and I know Chris uh, already sort of walked you through um, the concept of a spectrogram, uh, but here we have one um, for a longer period of time from early March to early May. Uh, so on the y-axis, we have frequency. 
um, date on the x-axis and then intensity and in color. Um, so when you see the warmer colors like uh, red or yellow, that indicates more intensity in a given frequency. Um, so once you start to uh, review some of these sound files and develop a little bit of intuition um, for what you're looking at here, you can start to pick out patterns um, that are driven by the biology in the area. So on the far left-hand side of the screen, um, you have uh, what looks like three um, vertical bands here that uh, stretch across the whole frequency band that we're looking at. And these are signals that are generated by um, coursing activity of silver perch during the evening hours. If you move towards the end of March, you start to see vertical bands that are a little bit shorter, um, so they don't stretch all the way to uh, the top of the frequency band that we're looking at here. Um, these are signals that are generated by the coursing activity of spotted sea trout during the evening hours. If you move uh, a little bit to the right into um, early April, you start to see three horizontal bands in the spectrogram. And these are signals that are generated by uh, gulf toadfish. And these uh, fish will call really throughout the entire day. So that's why it's a nice steady signal. And then moving into late April and early May, you start to see a bunch of horizontal bands that are stacked one on top of each other. Um, and these are signals that are generated by um, an Atlantic midshipman. Um, so you can start to sort of map out the uh, vocalization activity on these reefs. And since a lot of them are associated with spawning activity, um, you can really get a sense for these reefs as they function as important spawning grounds um, for these organisms. I also wanted to uh, briefly talk about some of the work that we're, we're doing um, at oyster dredging sites. So one thing I was interested in is seeing if you could use these sounds to learn about uh, disturbance that might be caused by oyster dredging or fishing at some of these sites. So in order to investigate this, um, we chose a site in Copano Bay. Uh, this is the Lap Reef sites. There are two artificial reefs here that were installed by the Nature Conservancy in 2019. Um, both of these reefs were left unfished for about two years. And then in November of 2021, the salt reef was opened up to fishing. Um, so it became harvestable at that point while the north reef was left um, closed as a sanctuary reef. So we were able to uh, collect acoustic data at both of these sites um, before and after the introduction of dredging uh, on the salt reef to see if there was any type of signal that we could pick up. So in uh, looking at this, this is sort of what we expected to see. Um, we expected the acoustic measures to be similar on both reefs before the introduction of dredging. Um, once dredging uh, occurred on the fished reef, we expected there to be some degradation um, in the soundscape, and this could be due to either direct uh, mortality um, as the uh, fishing vessels are, are dredging the area or just loss of habitat and emigration um, from that area by soniferous or sound producing organisms. We would then expect to see some recovery in the soundscape as the sound producing organisms come back to the site, um, eventually leveling off uh, either at or near those unfished levels. So we were able to collect some data um, beforehand, and this is what the sound pressure level trends looked like on both reef. Um, so it was nearly identical through time on both the North Sanctuary Reef and the South Harvestable Reef before the introduction of dredging. ACI followed very similar trends. Um, so the uh, acoustic complexity index levels were, were very close on both reefs before the introduction of dredging. Um, through that pre-disturbance period. And finally, we were able to listen for fish calling activity on the sanctuary reef. We detected the calls of silver perch, hardhead catfish, gulf toadfish, spotted sea trout, Atlantic midshipmen, and black drum. And on the harvestable reef, we observed all of the same fish with the exception of the black drum. So really in all of the acoustic measures that we were looking at, um, the soundscapes were nearly identical on both reefs before the introduction of dredging. 
And we've been uh, recording these soundscapes for the post-dredging period um, for a few months now. Um, but again, what we expect to see when we, we collect the data and analyze it um, is a degraded soundscape on the fish reef, a recovery in the soundscape, and eventually a leveling off um, either at or near the unfished levels. So the findings uh, so far from some of my research are that oyster reef soundscapes are louder with increased resident biomass um, at the sites that I've investigated. Soundscapes are more complex with increased resident biodiversity. And acoustic monitoring may be useful for detecting acute local disturbances. And another uh, important finding is that um, these sampling techniques are complementary. Uh, so there are some organisms that we detect using the passive acoustic techniques that we haven't sampled in our oyster sampling units yet, and vice versa. Um, so I would encourage any scientists or managers who are interested in studying these communities to try to use both sampling techniques whenever possible. But I do think there's um, a lot of utility in using passive acoustics to keep an eye on these communities in between the physical sampling points, which are typically um, a little bit more spread out. And I'd like to acknowledge everyone who uh, made this research possible, starting with my funding source, which is the Margaret Davidson Fellowship through NOAA, um, all of my collaborators at the Heart Research Institute and the Nature Conservancy, and everyone who joined me out in the field. And with that, Chris and I will take any questions that you have. Thank you both. Um, all right, so we'll take questions now. You can go ahead and type them into the chat as you think of them. Um, we'll have to verbalize them for you if you uh, miss the beginning of the webinar. It's chat's only visible to the organizers, so we'll have to verbalize questions for you, but don't be shy. Um, I guess to get started, you know, are there any, well, I think if you look back on the project, what was one thing that you think was like the most surprising finding? I don't know which one of you wants to go first. Maybe Chris go first. Yeah. Um, well, one thing that I didn't get a chance to talk about a ton, but the one of the biggest hurdles with acoustic monitoring is still the analysis, because at this point, it's still a developing field and it's rapidly developing, but much of the analysis depends on manual listening and reviewing of files. And as Phil will be able to attest, it takes a long time. <laughs> and so that aspect of it, um, is somewhat the limiting factor at this point of how much and how big of a project you can do is, is managing that. There's a lot of work being currently focused on developing AI and machine learning, those kinds of things to accurately identify these sound sources underwater. But one of the problems is that we get a lot of fish and other organisms that are calling at the same frequency. And so when their calls overlap, it's really hard to distinguish which one it is. And so as that develops, um, that will really advance the field a lot more. But that was kind of one of the challenges and one of the surprising things, I guess, that um, we had to deal with is, is managing that. I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that, Phil. Yeah, um, so a couple things that I've been really surprised about in, in doing um, these projects are just how productive these oyster reef soundscapes are. Um, just how many different, you know, species of fish are, are vocalizing. I always get really excited when we find uh, a new species um, that pops up on the reefs. Um, and I guess just how rapidly uh, the soundscape evolves on these reefs. Um, so on the, the newly restored reef at, at Goose Island, um, the sound levels on the reef were approaching those on the, the newly restored reef within a few months of, of their installment. Um, so I, I just, I think it's, it's very rapid how, how quickly um, things are seemingly uh, colonizing those reefs and, and making noise there. But those are the two main findings or, or surprising things that I've come across. Awesome, thank you. 
A few questions are rolling in. Uh, before I jump into those, somebody left a comment that just said, uh, I was going to say that the sound of that cute fish sounded like a phone vibrating on a counter. So if you're looking for more ways to describe sounds to people when you're talking about them, there's another free one for you. Uh, okay, so we got a couple more questions here that we can try to run through in the last few minutes you have together here. Uh, first question, are there only a certain selection of species you've recorded and therefore can detect? If not, how do you identify any new species you record? Yeah, I can I can take this one. Um, so the yeah the hydrophones aren't set to record um, certain species. They'll they'll detect anything that are are within range and are loud enough. I, I suppose um, there are a lot of challenges associated with uh, trying to figure out what species you're actually hearing. Um, they the sounds uh, do have unique characteristics. For example, um, the frequency band that they're communicating in. Uh, the duration of the calls. Um, you can also look at what type of or what time of day um, you're you're hearing the calls, and then you sort of dig into the literature um, and try to figure out uh, what sound you're hearing, um, because there is a lot of documentation out there for uh, sound-producing animals. There are also a couple um, good uh, libraries with fish sounds that you can you can check into if you have a feeling for what it might be that you're hearing. Um, but sometimes you're not able to get to the bottom of, of what's calling. Um, so uh, I showed a figure where there was um, uh, an organism that was making a, a croaking sound, and it was really um, it was it was uh, making that sound for a three month period, and we we never figured out um, what it was. Um, so there there's still some that are uh, left. Uh, a mystery, um, but one thing we're hoping to do is get some of these animals into um, tanks and put a hydrophone in there and see if we can solve some of those mysteries. Yeah, and I'll just add that there is that, yeah, we're totally limited by ones that have been established and we can compare to, and the literature is rife with unidentified sound, this and knocking and purring, and <laughs> but there are a couple efforts right now to help develop a, a global sound library. So people are starting to contribute more and more. And so that will help our understanding. There's the Discovery of Sound in the Sea website that has is a great resource. It has a really nice sound library. And I'll also mention there's also um, a bioacoustic stack exchange that's just getting started up and being supported by loggerhead instruments, which makes a lot of the hydrophones. And so there's just more, it's a growing, rapidly growing field, and there's more and more resources all the time. So it's it's encouraging that way. That's really cool. Uh, I guess this one you kind of answered, but uh, somebody wanted to know what if you had any theories on what was making the unidentified croaking. Sounds like that's a, a no, but that's okay. Um, so next question, what advice would you give yourself if you were to participate in this research project again? That's a good question. <laughs> I'm not sure. We, I mean, I guess just to, um, there's so many opportunities and so many ways you can take this at some points it can be overwhelming to to pick some and in some ways it matters less of getting the perfect combination of things and just getting something and going forward so don't have that um i guess it's a form of analysis paralysis of which way do we take this because there's so many options um well, that was something I, I would say we dealt with a little bit trying to formulate the framework. But what about your, from your perspective, Phil? I, I think the advice I would give to myself is to um, try to train up on, on machine learning techniques, try to get a better handle on that and try to use it for automated detection um, because it really is very time consuming to manually review these um, sound files for uh, fish calls. Um, so I think that would be my main piece of advice. And we're we're still trying to get into that a little bit here. That's a good one. Okay, a few more questions here. Let's see if we can get through them. Uh, do you ever anticipate using active and passive acoustics in tandem to understand biological community dynamics? Would this be helpful for getting a holistic understanding of a site? Yeah, that's a great idea and a great approach and we've thought about it a lot and we've done it a little bit so the idea is passive acoustics you can listen and see which organisms are there 
active acoustics, you can get measures of biomass. So start to try to figure out how many individuals because that's hard to get with just sound alone. So the two theoretically complement each other really well. Um, some of our members on our team have done some of that. So Kevin Boswell is an expert in active acoustics and has worked with Robert Dunn and um, Matt Kimball up in South Carolina, and they've done some active acoustics to look at some movements of predator and prey species. Um, it's often limited by the depth of the water. And so in so many estuaries we're working in, it's so shallow, active acoustics doesn't work or becomes very challenging. And so that has been what's kept us from, from trying to do that, is the that shallow, shallow water. And why we, in most scenarios, gone to other sampling methods, either Phil's sampling units or just good old, you know, gill nets and seine nets for seeing what's in there. Phil, anything to add? Yeah, I would just, um, I agree with everything that, that Chris said. I, I think the main um, thing is that it's very logistically challenging to get that type of equipment um, on some of the shallow reefs, but I do think it would shed a lot of light. Um, one thing that I've been trying to do is relate uh, sound levels on the reef to biomass. And a lot of the, the more mobile species were not sampling with our oyster sampling units. So I do think that would provide a more complete picture and the relationships would probably be even stronger um, if we were able to incorporate that. Okay, two more questions to see if we can get them both answered. Is there any way that you are measuring how the distance between the established and newly restored reefs influences the colonization of the new reefs? Um, so I'm, I'm not looking into that. I would imagine um, that the distance would be influencing uh, recruitment on the reefs. Um, those sites are uh, about... Uh, I think 250 to 300 meters apart. Um, so I'm sure there's a lot of, uh, you know, um, there's a lot of uh, recruitment going back and forth between those those reefs. And it seems like there is a little bit of a stagger. Um, if a species shows up on one reef, um, you know, a month or two later, they start showing up on the other reefs. So um, I'm not looking at that, but I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot of uh, connectivity between the reefs that we're looking at. All right. Okay, this is a good one to end on. Um, is there a good way to use citizen science for data analysis? And if so, how would you train? Yeah, I think there's definitely that possibility. And it's a lot of the same ways that you train machine learning is you get a nice library of examples of what sea trout sound like in all the different ways and different habitats and different group numbers and use that as your template to compare to and then you have to have you know, some degree of verification process from experts too so i think there is um but again, we're still so, I mean, Bill can talk a little bit more because he's probably gone through this more recently than I have of the learning curve of learning to identify. It takes, it takes a while to get your ears trained in and your eyes trained in to understand and differentiate what you're hearing and seeing in those recordings. Um, so I think it's possible, but maybe we don't have the perfect system kind of thought out yet of how that would work. Yeah, I, I agree with um, all of that. There's there's certainly a, a learning curve to, um, you know, uh, figuring out exactly what you're listening to. Um, but we've worked on, on projects with a couple of undergraduate students at this point, um, and it's really just a matter of uh, giving them um, an acoustic library of, of sounds that you typically hear. Um, on the, the reefs, uh, giving them a few examples of each species, uh, for example, and then, you know, just having them listen to as many sound files as possible. Um, it's a lot of back and forth, uh, you know, is this what I'm hearing here? Um, I'm not sure what I'm hearing here. And then, you know, you, you tell them and, and typically, next time they hear that, they know what they're listening to. Um, so it's a lot of time just, uh, 
sitting together and, and listening to sounds together. Um, yeah, and, and just figuring out what you're you're listening to. And I will say too, like when we really get stuck, there are a little bit more advanced analysis techniques that we have to utilize. You know, so we're using programming and MATLAB or R to look at the power spectrum density, which is telling us exactly which frequencies and what the power in each frequency the sound is composed of, which helps us zero in on on certain species or others. Um, and filtering and doing some different things like that. That's a little bit more challenging for a citizen science setup. That's fair. All right. Well, we are uh, over time actually, so I'll have to end it there. Uh, if you missed the beginning of the webinar, just a quick note that we don't have a webinar next month, but we are planning to be back in September. More details to follow at a later date. But a big thank you to Phil and Chris for the great presentations, for sharing the sound files with us and talking us through everything. Uh, thank you all for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of the season. If you can get outside and find some time to enjoy the weather, then please do. With that, everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.